Uh, Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. Your word is our life. Your word is our light. Your word is our salvation. Your word is our instruction. And your word is our rock and our foundation. Help us, God, now to look into the everlasting light, the everlasting love that is your word, and be changed, transformed from glory to glory. God, I ask for myself and the men that are in here today to swallow deep what the word has to say. Please, God, help us not to run from your spirit, but to embrace the correction and power of your word today. In Christ Jesus we ask this. Amen. Amen. Sometimes in Scripture, there's an admonition to be something you're not. And it's like we talked about yesterday, last week for the ladies, where the Scripture just, man, it, it hits the sky. Boom. And you could do one of two things. You could, you could look at it and go, man, I'm, I'm such a failure. I'll never, I'll never make it. Or you could say, you know what? I'm a failure, but I'm a work in progress, and I'm going in that direction. And, and it's a point in time in every man's life, and every woman's life as well, more so for men, where the reality of doing what you're supposed to do, as opposed to what you want to do, hits. For some men, it's that marriage thing. Remember me and my girlfriend living together for the first five or six years and having a couple of kids, and people saying to me, bro, when are you going to marry that girl? I mean, what are you going to do? do? Do the whole family, you know, and, and not have... And I, I'd always say, yeah, we're going to have... Um, people always used to ask us, well, she was Southern Baptist, so you're going to have a Southern Baptist wedding? And, and I claim to be Catholic, but I never went to church, but what does that matter, right? If you're Catholic. And so are we going to have a Catholic wedding? And I used to say, no, we're going to have a shotgun wedding, because to get me there, you're going to need a gun. <laughs> it was just a, the ramblings of a ch silly child. Oh, I was in my 20s, and still just a child. Now, some of us here are 30s, 40s, 50s, just children. We're just, we refuse to embrace what we're called to do, instead of trying to embrace what we're supposed to do, what we need to do, what we have to do. Are you with me? Yeah. Today, guys, <laughs> it's our turn. Last week we got the ladies pretty good. Um, the Word of God served it up in a frying pan pretty hot. Today it's ours. And ladies, be merciful. Keep your elbows to yourself. This would be one of those things where Andrew comes up there and says, Man, 15 women came and asked for the CD today. Probably not a good way to witness to your non-believing husband or here, here's what you're a loser. First Timothy chapter three, verse one, Paul says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Give me your attention, please. If you want to be a bishop, if you want to be a bishop, now a bishop is what we call an elder. Now guys, most of us as men are goal-driven. Goal-driven. Goals are greater than anything else that we can desire. For me, it's a black belt. I can't wait to be a black belt. When I first put that white belt on, and I had heard some guys get there in five years, some takes 10, I thought, well, I'm not a terrible athlete, but I'm certainly not BJ Penn. I'm not gonna get my black belt in three, for four years. So I figured, how long is it gonna take? Well, it's eight years. And I'm another year and a half away, probably, if I could stay healthy, if I could stay dedicated, if my wife will keep letting me go. Now, when I get my black belt, do you know what I get with that? Nothing. It's a goal. I set a goal. I set a goal for myself, and I want to keep that goal. If you're one of those people who just sets a goal, if you're a business person, if you're a, a, you sell homes and you're looking for that million-dollar house, how many million-dollar sales do you have? 
And you know, you've sold the 300, you've sold the, you want that million dollar sale. Not just the commission that comes with it, but the prestige to say the million dollar sale. It's driving, it's, it's the goal, it's, it's that. How you doing, buddy? Okay, have fun. I didn't mind, it's okay. You gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> Here is a goal, an elder, a deacon, and some of us, we bring our goals here. And you come to church and you say, I want to be a deacon. I want to be an elder. Well, just like in the world, for some of us, for some of you guys, and I look around and some of you guys are wrestlers and some of you guys are fighters. If, if you're a fighter, you want the championship belt. You want the belt, man. You want the belt. So you find a RFA or ABC and, and you get the belt. And then you know what you find out? It's not enough. So you want the UFC. You know, you want that. You're gonna hit, you're gonna, you know, go big or go home, you know what I mean? And you know what they find out when they get the belt? Don't satisfy. It's a goal you set and you'd hope you'd reach that top, that Olympic gold medal, you know? You, all that without Christ. I just thought it would be more. I thought I'd get more out of it. Here are some goals that you could set for yourself. Listen, you can do these things in the flesh, guys. Or you can let God do them in the spirit and you'll find great satisfaction. You've heard me say, my house, my life, is a life built like a house of cards. Anybody ever build houses of cards? You hold one end, you put the other one on top, put the other one on top, and, and you get this, you build the house of cards, and somebody walks by and just the wind knocks it all down. That's my life. When you let Christ build your life, He builds this frail life around you on a stone foundation. Now some of you are like, what are you talking about? Listen. My whole house burns down. My whole house falls down if I have one kiss that's not my wife. If I take one dollar that's not mine. If I, you can name four or five different things that I can do and my whole house. Blah, 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 blah. Wife, kids, business, everything just falls apart. You gotta be careful because if you do these things in the flesh, and not in the spirit, you'll find yourself building a house based upon holding it together in your strength. Right now, even though my house is frail, somehow God holds it all together. 20 years now. 20 years of faithfulness to my wife. Praise God. Now some of you all are thinking, like, big deal. No, that is a big deal. I come from a family of cheaters. My father, it's an Italian way. How many of you all Italian here? Know what a dampanata is, maybe? It's just a way. Let me put it all together as we continue to read. He who desires the bishop, the position of a bishop, he desires a good work, a goal. A bishop then must be blameless. First rule, guys, if you're desiring in the house of God to be an elder here at the church. You want to be an elder at the church? You look at the elders of our church and, man, I want that position. I want that. Good. First thing is blameless. Well, what is it to be blameless? Let me explain to you. It's to be open and honest about who and what you are. It's not to be sinless, because nobody is, but it is to be blameless. Bro, I screwed up yesterday. What happened? Man, I was... And you tell somebody... You're open about it. They know. You guys look at me. I'm not sinless. I'm blameless. No, I don't have no skeletons in the closet. There's nothing you're going to find out. Oh, he's been embezzling money. It's openness. It's an honesty and a reality that people know. In case you guys don't know, I struggle with anger. I get angry. 
And sometimes I let righteous indignation fall over into sinful anger. I know a lot of my brothers are. And I can tell you right now, watch this. If, you're, if you want to, and you're desperately honest here, how many of you struggle with the same thing? Wow, I'm not alone. And you know it. I can give you my list of things, and, and, and as I say them, nothing I'm going to tell you is going to be like, really? You'll see it. I talk about it. I have the un enviable task of telling you my life, my testimony as the ability to give God glory, hoping that I don't go so far as to bring glory to me. I sit here and I tell you my testimony, I tell you my life and that fine line between glorifying God and making you think more high of me than you ought is there, it's drawn. And it's not easy. I go home and my wife will say, you know, baby, why do you tell people so... I don't know. You know, sometimes you just want to be a witness. You want to, you want to reach your life out there in the hopes that somebody else is got, going through the same thing and pull them in that same safety net with you. You understand what I'm saying? But sometimes, even as a preacher, you go over the line, it's like, you really made yourself look grandiose today. That's not what I wanted to do. I never want to do that. <laughs> Blameless. The husband of one wife. Check. <laughs> got, got that one. You know what's funny? I want you to remember something. Some of you guys are like, duh. No, let me explain to you what the New Testament is. Because this is very interesting. The New Testament is an instruction book on how to live in a godless society. The difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Testament is instructions on how to live in a theocracy, a, a, a nation governed by God. The New Testament is how to live in a godless society. And when it was written, a lot of guys had multiple wives. And let me let you know a little secret. Outside of, of USA land, in Muslim countries, a lot of men have multiple wives. And when we go over there as, as ministers, as missionaries, and we start churches, we tell people, we tell them, listen, your bishops, your deacons, they need to have just one wife. Well, I guess that disqualifies somebody. Because right now we look at it as, oh, who's not going to? Listen to me. Listen. There might be, if the Lord tarries, another 10, tw tops 20 years. This will be more relevant than ever. Because if you think that the whole issue of gay marriage was gay marriage, you're out of your mind. It ain't enough. They want more and more. Multiple wives, man, that's just another few years away. The Mormons are going to come out and say, wait, how can a man be married to a man and you can't tell me I can be married to more than one? And as the women's movement goes, well, if, if he can be married to more than one wife, why can't I be married to more than one husband? Well, right now we look at being married to more than just a husband and one. We think, ooh, that's disgusting. Only because the society we live in says so. But the society that we live in that was built on the Word of God is broken down. Not breaking down, broken down. Hey guys, let me let you know a little secret. You are now a minority. More people do not believe that this country should be based on God's Word than do. And we're looking for not politicians that want to take our country back. What we're looking for is Christians who will say, by life or by death, I will not follow what they believe. That's the new rule, guys. That's what Jesus is looking for. Not a politician who says, oh, I'll take office, and, and well, if it means I have to embrace this doctrine of, of politics or that doctrine of politics, we have to get, we have to win the country back for the Republicans. I ain't no freaking Republican. Believe that. I'm a Christian. I'm an independent. And if that means embracing what is not popular and what will never be elected into office again, that's fine with me. You understand that, men? Yeah. I mean, do we all understand what I'm saying? You get these new politicians that we think are the up-and-coming great ones, and they're all embracing everything that we don't believe in the hopes that there'll be enough who do believe so that they'll be re-elected. 
It's like, listen, I don't want to vote for a politician who just wants to be in office. I want to vote for a politician who says, if what I believe is no longer ever going to be in the majority again, then I guess I'll never be reelected. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Husband of but one wife. Who is it? It's coming, guys. Continuing. Temperate. Temperate. The word temperate means sober or vigilant. Not somebody who is a dreamer to the point of not being in reality. Somebody who has this idea, I'll work today, I'll make the money, and then tomorrow I'll get up and do it again. Not, I had an idea. I'm going to make a t-shirt company, and I'm going to make a billion dollars. Well, you probably should get a job anyway. No, I'm putting everything into you. Well, how are you going to pay the rent next month? Doesn't matter. You guys understand? Temperate. Somebody wise, plan for the future. These are the requirements of a deacon. Now, some of you guys might be sitting here going, look, I don't want to be a deacon in your church. I guess go to sleep for a little while then. <laughs> I'll wake you up when we finish. I'm talking guys who are goal-driven. Look, in the gym, I'm not a black belt. Here, I'm a black belt. <laughs> Earned. Earned. 20 years plus now of testing. 20 years of raising a family in Christ. 20 years of being married to a Christian woman. I'm a black belt. And I'm telling you guys, wake up. Because there is no greater reward you'll get from life than doing these things. These are just not a bunch of rules and regulations, gentlemen. This is a way to live a happy, satisfied, godly life that will bring you more satisfaction than the million dollar sale, the belt from the UFC, uh, whatever it is that you think is your goal, world champions or whatever. These things here are not just goals to shoot for, they're recipes for true success. Did you hear that? Man. Blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded. Sober-minded, as a matter of fact, you see those next four words, sober-minded, good behavior, that's all one word. That is somebody who's chosen to do what they're supposed to do, not what they want to do. Somebody who's doing what they are supposed to do, not what they want to do. When they go in my office, a couple goes to my office and we sit down and the guy tells me, I met this girl online and she's everything I wanted. And, and I say, dude, you have a wife and you have a kid, cut it out. But I want, but I feel, but I desire. It's like, Dude, do you think I want to be married every day? Me and my wife are together 25 years. Do you think she wants to be married to me every day of those 25 years? No. But like a godly woman and like a godly man, we choose what we're supposed to do, what we have to do, over what we want to do, what we desire to do. Some men are just led astray every other week by their members. I felt like it, I felt like it, I saw it. I, they live like dogs. You know how a dog lives? Pardon me, my young brothers, and pardon me, ladies. They either eat it or they hump it. You cannot live like a dog, my brothers. You must be sober-minded and of good behavior. Doing what you're supposed to do. Doing what God wants you to do, not what you feel like doing. Do I have to say it again? My wife's like, no. <laughs> no, we'll talk about that later. Hospitable. Hospitable. Now, this is interesting because this is not a requirement of a deacon, but this is a requirement of an elder. You could circle the word for hospitable and you write people person. You got to like people. You got to like people. If you're going to be in the church and you don't like people, now some of you guys that are people person don't even realize what it's not like to be a people person. Guys, listen to me. 
I am by nature, apart from the Holy Spirit, not a people person. But when the Spirit fills me up, and He starts to work in your heart, one of the miraculous things God does, listen, now some of us are looking at this, guys, and we're thinking, that's never going to be me. I can never make this. Never, ever going to make this. No, you're right. With God, all things are possible, though. And the crazy thing is, when you first come to the Lord and you, you surrender your heart to Him, and you say, God, take me as I am, some things He does miraculously and supernaturally. I've seen people come to the Lord, and immediately, as they're walking up the aisle, or as they stand up, the Holy Spirit shines down on them, and He burns off crack addiction, prostitution, uh, you name it. You know, drug sales. You, God does that. Sometimes miraculously just burns it off. And the first thing that happens is a young believer, you go, yes, yes, yes. And you praise God. And then a couple of months later, you realize, why do I still have these feelings, though? Man, I can't stop turning my head or I can't stop wanting to point and click on the computer. And they go, man, I guess it, what happened in church was not real. No, it was real, but God sometimes leaves you with things that He wants you to struggle with in order to make you stronger in life and in ministry. Do you understand that? He wants you to be strong so that you can be weak in other areas so He can make you strong in the areas that you're weak. I know that's really weird to sound and understanding, but watch what I mean. If you're not a people person and you want to be an elder and God wants you to be an elder, God will supernaturally add you as a people person. He will make you what you are not in order for you. Perfect example is Austin. Austin got saved, little drug addict off the street, working in my store, robbing from me behind my back. Thought I didn't know how wrong he was. But there was something about him. And we start the church in the house and he's like, Oh, can I come? I'm like, yeah, of course. Everybody's welcome. And the first day he helped set up the chairs. And you could see God was doing a, a radical work in his life. The few, first few months, you just seen him start to change. There was no moment in time where he stood up and the clouds part and the light shine, but you just... You saw God doing something. You saw little by little God start to scrape. And I said, you know, I don't want you to be with the kids. We had a youth pastor. We had a young man we were raising up. I want you to be with the men. I want the men of this church to come to see what God can do at a man who surrendered. And he said, okay. And all that time, God was like, Ryan, he's your youth pastor. No, no, you don't know what you're talking about, God. And God gave him the ability to be a youth pastor. Things he didn't know, things he didn't have, things he didn't understand. Because the need at our church was great. And God looked for just a surrendered vessel. And God gave him this supernaturally. Are you understanding now what's going on? Hospitable. Able to teach. Able to teach. Now that's not able to teach in a way where... They have to be, you know, Pastor Bob, and they come up and they're smooth about That's not that word. This is able to teach as somebody who actually enjoys sharing the principles of God with other people. Some people don't like doing that. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to go to seminary school. You don't, that's not this word. Able to teach. Can you help other people understand? It doesn't have to be some smooth talker. I think I make that clear, don't I? Verse 3, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. I mean, you'd hopefully you'd expect that, right? Imagine if you came here one day and, Pastor Lee, uh, could I talk to you? And he sit down, all of a sudden, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he burps something. you're like, man, that dude smells like beer. Sorry, I had a you know, beer last night with my dinner. You drink beer with your dinner? Well, he had the freedom to drink beer. You think God doesn't love you if you drink a beer? Lee can drink as many beers as he wants. How many beers you had last week, Lee? <laughs> Me neither. You know why? I've chosen not to. 
because I want to be an elder in the church. It doesn't mean God doesn't love me if I drink a beer or wine. Here to be an elder, though, he says, don't do that. Why? Because your judgment will be impaired. From one beer, you bet. One joint, for sure. It's not a matter of can and can't. It's what you choose now. You want to be an elder of the church? Don't be given to wine. You can't be violent. You can't, don't, don't, I can't have your wife come and tell me you're punching holes in the wall. Not if you want to be an elder. I'm not talking about you lost your temper once three years ago. And that's, listen, it happens. I'm talking about violence cannot be a part of your makeup. L gentlemen, it's one thing to lose your temper. It's another thing to lose control. I lose my temper regularly. I don't lose control anymore. Not greedy for money. Now that greedy for money is a phrase meaning you can't be, a, you can't be so, so covetous for money that you'll do anything to get it. Do you understand? You can't sell a, you know, sell an ounce of dope just because the money was there. Oh, I didn't want it, but I really needed it. You can't be so greedy for money. But gentle. That word for gentle is not the, the normal word like a gentleman. That word means patient and approachable. Patient and approachable. Elder, potential elder of the church, you must be able to talk to people in a way that they feel that they can approach you and talk to you. And you must be patient. You must be patient. Because here's what happens. The husband and the wife will usually, if they're having problems, and this is the vast majority of the things that happen in, in churches, is husbands and wives, the wife will come up to you and tell you how terrible their husband is. And you can't rise up with indignation to want to smash the husband without first understanding. There's another side to the story, wait till you hear it. Because it happens all the time. You sit down with a husband, with a wife, and she tells you how terrible the husband is. And then you sit down with the husband, and you find out she didn't tell me that part of the story. And here I spent a few days really upset. So we always say, you know what, can you, can you bring him in? Can you bring her in? Can we all sit down together? She didn't tell me you slept with his best friend. That's kind of a small detail to leave out, don't you think? We laugh, but this is what this is ministry, guys. And it's going to go into, you'll see how it, it fits in. This is ministry. This is part of being a people person. Oh my goodness, you deal with a lot of drama, don't you? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And you know what? I guarantee you, you sit around and you look at your elders and your deacons of this church. And by the way, let me, let me also make that clear. To you, if you're looking for a church to go to, if you're thinking about a church and you're just visiting our church now, our guys are tested in this. I don't put, we've, we've been a church now for almost nine years. Do you, know, do you know how many times we've appointed deacons and elders? Once. We're going to do it again in the coming year because there's some guys who have really stepped up. Once. Because we make sure that you're in good hands. We're not trying to raise up a church. We're not trying to build a, we've, we've talked about that before. Gentle, not quarrelsome. Quarrelsome, that's an interesting word. In the Greek, it's a machos. A machos, where we get our English word for macho man. Macho man. You can't be quarrelsome. Now, if you notice it in the Greek, it's a machos. Whenever you see a word in the Greek that has an a at the beginning of it, that means anti or against. So you can't, you must be, if you're an elder, against, you can't be a macho man. That's not saying you can't be a man's man, but you can't be so... Look, when my brother Danny first started coming to church here, he was very guarded, very... Came here because somebody invited him. He was just, hey bro, my name's Ryan, nice to meet you. You can't, you can't be one of those guys who sees another guy who's standoffish and, and go, yeah, same to you, you know what I mean? There's this unsaid thing. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at that guy. You can't do that. You got to let that go. You got to walk up. Hey, man, how you doing? My name is... You can't look at a guy like Christian and, and be so intimidated. Oh, my goodness. That guy, he's a big dude. 
I don't do that. You can't. You've got to be a machos against that. That's that word for quarrelsome there. You want to be an elder of the church? These are the rules. And might I add, you want happiness and peace and joy in your life? These are the rules. Not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Listen to me. This is super important. Potential elder of the church. It didn't say your whole family has to be Christians. It said your house has to be in subjection. You can't walk for your children. You can't walk for your wife. You can't walk for your husband, but you've got to be able to rule your house. I'm in control of my house. My kids, I'm, I praise God that they love Jesus. Every single day I thank God for that. But if they didn't, that'd be okay. That's a choice they have to make. I, hopefully they're not faking it for my behalf. But let me tell you something. I run my house. If I want to walk and open everybody's door, I said to my son the other day, um, if this door is locked again, I'm taking it off the hinges. He's 16 years old. I don't care if he's 25 years old. You live in my house, my rules. As long as I pay the bills, I make the rules. No little person runs my house using my love against me. I don't love you anymore. <laughs> that means I'm going to kick your little... <laughs> no, honey, don't say that. That's not nice. We laugh. You know who's laughing? I'll tell you who's laughing. The people who could never understand that. But there's some people here that are crying. Inside, that's my house. Little people run my house. <laughs> can't be an elder of the church. You must have your house in subjection. Well, what if you have a teenager and, you know, you throw them out. You throw out a teenager? Better destroy their flesh and let them go to heaven than, than let them destroy their soul and go to hell. Do you believe parents that are here? That's where the reality of faith comes in. Because right now, right now, there's still a remnant of God in them. There's still something in them. If you take them and continue to spoil them rotten, you watch how that 20-something turns into a horrible person. And that person's not going to heaven. But where is the line between heaven and hell? I, I don't know, but as long as I run my house, uh, there would be no ungodliness in it. And I get that they get thrown out. Are you saying you've thrown out your kids from your house? Yeah. Most of them don't make it past the driveway, but they get thrown out. They know I'm serious. There's a number of things that we've done. Taking doors off the hinges, removing furniture from the rooms, giving them a pillow and a blanket, and that's it. Having to earn their things back. I used to do, when Elena was just a little girl, we used to do what's called boot camp, kid boot camp. I'd make them get up early in the morning, I'd make, them do, have, I'd make them do more than they've done in their entire day before 8 o'clock in the morning when they're allowed to eat breakfast. And then schoolwork, and then more chores, and, and, I mean, and it's miserable. Here's why it's miserable, guys, because we're the ones that got to do it. It's harder on us than it is on them. And listen, guys, <laughs> and ladies, I mean no disrespect when I say this, if you think they're going to do it when you're not there, they're not. They're busy. They got the other kitties to worry about. So you're going to have to do it yourself, elder of the church, leader of your home. Continuing. Not as a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. Um, that word for novice means newly planted. I don't care how wonderful, special, how godly you are. It's a crazy thing. Some people in the world display more of these attributes than people in the church. And rightly so, because normally the people that are in a church are screwed up. We are. That's why we came to the Lord, because we ruined our lives. That's me. 
I'm messed up. I was messed up. I lived ill. I lived wrong. I lived terribly. I came to God. He forgave me. And now I bring all my baggage to church. And I wish God would just take it all from me, but he didn't. He didn't. Do you understand that? He doesn't do that. So some people that are in the world that have not been broken, have not been put in that place yet that they need God, they have more of these attributes than we have. And I don't care. Let's just start. Let's, let's just be planted and let God start to root us and build us up and strengthen us. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It's never too late to start. 20s, 30s, 40s, it's never too late to start and say, God, fill me with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Fill me with these things. I've lived so many years without them. God's never, ever too late to change you. You know that old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? God could teach anybody anything. Amen. I love that about God. Likewise, deacons, so now that was the qualification for elders. Now the qualification for deacons. What's a deacon? You could circle that word for deacon and write servant or waiter. Servant or waiter. You want to be a servant or a waiter in the church? You want to be a deacon? You want to be somebody who I send across the street to get cream cheese when we're out of it? No, I want to teach the Bible. Okay, no problem. Sunday, right after, Matt is going to take a team over. We're going to go over to the uh, convalescent home. Sa Saturday morning, Ryan and Marty can take, and you can go there and you can teach the Bible. No, I want to teach the Bible in front of a lot of people. Better go to a different church then. <laughs> Ain't never going to be a lot of people here. Ain't never going to be more people than there is today. You know that? But don't you want to... No, no, listen to me. In case you don't understand this, this is the size of our church. This is what it's going to be. That's it. If it gets much bigger than this and we have to go to a second service, I'm sending Matt to Del Rey with about 40 or 50 of you guys and start another one. I can minister to all of you. I am your pastor. You don't have to wait online. Well, maybe for a half hour or so, but I'll have time. And I'll baptize you, and I'll, and I'll um, minister to you, and I'll do your weddings, and I'll do the funerals for your family. I'll, me, I'll do them all. And if, get, if I can't do that, then I don't want to... It's not, it's not the goal of our church, to be a big church. So if you want to teach the Bible to a lot of people, you got First Press, you got Calvary Fort Lauderdale, you got First Baptist Fort Lauderdale, lots and lots and lots of people. Continuing. Deacons must be reverent. Reverent. That word for reverent means broken for real. Broken for real. Reverent is that place that you are. We've been talking a lot about this over the last year. Gentlemen, when you are not your God anymore, when God has broken you so completely and so in reality, that you realize that your strength does not come from you. And if God has a plan for your life, whether that's to be a million dollar seller, a UFC champion, or anything in between, it's what God's going to do. And what God's going to do is good enough for you. Do you understand that? That's that reverence. That's that you look at somebody and you see this prideful, pile of strength and this tower and this pillar and you sit down with him in 10 minutes and you realize I have nothing I am nothing my strength comes from God my success comes from God it's I am not who you think I am I use well the gifts and tools that God's given me and I use them confidently but I don't use them arrogantly do you understand? Gentlemen, do you understand? Fully broken. Are you going to keep going? Yeah, I'm actually going through the whole... Not double-tongued. You know what double-tongued means? That's to tell a different story. The literal translation is to tell a different story. There's an old saying 
that a lie makes it around the world before the truth has put its shoes on. And when you come to me and you tell me a story, you got into an argument with this, or this happened, that happened, then all of a sudden I find out, wow, you left out a lot of the details. That's double-tongued. That's what double-tongued is. You can't be a deacon of the church. Sometimes, and there's a Bible verse in the Proverbs that says that the first person to tell his story always seems right until the second person comes along and tells you what really happened. But a deacon has no problem waiting for the whole thing to come together and doesn't mind if people think less of him until the truth comes out. Do you understand that? You come to me and you say, one of your deacons did such and such and such. And the deacon didn't come to me. He didn't tell me nothing. Matter of fact, he don't even care that you said anything ill of him. And then all of a sudden, a few months later, I'm talking to him and I say, hey, uh, what happened with such and such, such and such? Oh, here's what I, and then I hear, hear what happened. And the deacon didn't mind that somebody thought less of him. Do you understand that principle? You're okay with you and God being cool with it. You have a relationship with God, and you're okay with that. You don't mind if somebody thinks less of you. You don't got to let everybody on this side know that everybody on that side. You understand what I'm saying here? Real deacon of the church isn't trying to clear his name. He's okay with God clearing his name in the time to come. Truth eventually will put its shoes on, clear everything up. Nah. Not given too much wine. We talked about not greedy for money. Same thing as the elder. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. What's the mystery of the faith? Jesus died for your sins. It's a great mystery. There's no way to explain that to somebody who's not broken. There's no way to explain that. You just hold it. And when somebody tells you, listen, here's... <laughs> you guys, you meet people every day and they got it all, man. They're the million dollar seller. They got the belt. They got the trophy wife. They got the kids. There's some of them are your family members. And you think to yourself, here's what happens. If you're not an elder or a deacon, you think... And that guy, he don't need Jesus. Until you learn a little more, and you've been around a little more, until you've been tested and tried to find this out. You know what you find out? Everybody needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. There is no such thing as, well, that guy don't need Jesus because he has the belt. That guy don't need Jesus because he has a lot of money. That guy don't need Jesus because look at his wife. That guy don't need Jesus because, uh-uh. Everybody needs Jesus. And if they don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart, you've been called by God to share your faith with them, to help them. God did not put you in their path for another reason, my brother. And it wasn't to be a buddy of his in case he needs a new manager so you can make some more money. You understand? True deacon understands that. But let those also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Tested. That word for tested means proven, battle, ready. Proven, battle, ready. Ready? Here's the part of that a deacon understands. This is the worst part about being a Christian from a new Christian perspective. You ready? Try to clear yourself for a second. Now come back to me. You come to the Lord, you surrender your heart, everything is great, and God says, now I've got to put him through a really horrible trial. God says that? Yes, God says that. Why? So you can be tested. Why? So you can be a deacon and elder. Well, then I don't know if I want to do this. It's God's plan for me to be tested? Absolutely. Uh-uh, I went to this church up the block, and they said that if you're, if you're going through trials, it's because you don't have enough faith. If you have cancer, if you have this, if your wife this, if, that you means you don't have enough faith. Well, that's not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, you must be tested. So we see somebody in the church, we look at a, a guy like the Corn family, we just prayed for him today. We see they have a heart of servants, we see they're working things out, we see them becoming this stone, this foundational part of our family. So why don't we make him a deacon? We gotta wait till they're tested first. How's God gonna test him? I don't know. He's gonna do it though. 
You mean God's going to put them through a really nasty trial right through the fire? And how they come out on the other side is whether we know or not, they are holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Whether they are serious about this thing and not just... A lot of people like coming to church because they're people person apart from God and they just want to hang out with a lot of people. And I know who you guys are. And I know who you guys aren't. You guys are the ones that are falling asleep right now. Like, listen, I come here for God's word. Come on, give me the word. I understand. I've talked a long time and I talk a lot. It's okay to fall asleep and yawn. I don't mind. I'll just have... Shane, hit you in the back of the head. Hit JD, he's working, he's falling asleep. They must be tested, then let them serve as deacons and be found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. You mean I could be a deacon if my wife wasn't? That's right. Immediately. As you become a deacon, your wife becomes a quote-unquote deaconess. Immediately. Now, there are some rare exceptions that we've made, but immediately. If you want to be a deacon or an elder in this church, your wife has to be serious about the things of the Lord. Not a slandering, backbiting, gossiping, irreverent, ill-mannered. I just had to take that time to beat the guys up so much. It just felt good to beat the girls up again for a minute. <laughs> Verse 12. Let deacons be the husbands of but one wife, of course, ruling their children in their own house as well. Same thing as for the elders. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Please give me your attention. This is the verse that I chose to be a deacon. When I was at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and they came to me and they said, Ryan, they want to make you a deacon. I said, no thanks, not interested. Got the wrong guy. It's not for me. And one of my pastors, Pastor Chet, said, what are you talking about? And I said, I don't want to be a deacon. I'm too busy right now. My business is, is going off the rails. Um, you know, and, and I got a lot of issues at home. I, I still working through. I, I appreciate you recognizing. We like to serve in the church. We love, but I am not interested in being a deacon. Uh, he showed me this list of things, and I was, I was so short. I said, no way. No way. I, I can't do it. I'm, th I'm not these things. And if I'm going to be real about this faith, I'm going to be real about this faith. I'm not here to strive. The best thing about coming to Christ, for me, guys, I wasn't trying to be a black belt. If I was going to become a black belt, God was going to do it. I didn't have to learn, you know, Five escapes from Mount, three guard pads. I didn't have to learn how to, you know, sell a million dollars. I didn't have to do any of that. The best thing about coming to Christ was no more striving. I was done striving. All my life I've been goal-oriented, and every goal that I achieved found nothing. I was empty and alone with all my goals met. And I said, no. And he came and he took me to this verse. He said, let me explain something to you. According to scripture, it said, those who serve well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Meaning you will please God by serving well as a deacon. And if your overseers and elders see that this is you, then you do what you're asked to do if you're doing it for Christ. And I said, okay then, if it's for Christ, because it ain't, it ain't for you guys. Are you understanding me? Continuing and finishing. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Paul was actually telling them you want to visit them. This was a letter that he wrote to them. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God. Remember, last week I said that to you. These are not ways to conduct yourself outside of the church. These are ways that you conduct yourself in the church. Now, what does that mean? Shouldn't we be the same in the world as we are in the church? No, 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 no. Yes, of course, you don't want to be a make-believer and a faker. But this is the hierarchy. This is how you arrange a church. This is instruction for us as the pastors, elders, leaders, deacons of this church to help us to run the church. Here's how you run your church, man. This is what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. This is what God is trying to tell us. This is how you conduct yourself in the house of God, guys. Now, if some of you guys are here and the Spirit's moving upon your heart and you're like, you know you're falling short. You smoked five joints over the weekend, drank a beer, you know, punched a hole in a whatever these things. Listen to me. We don't judge you. We were there. That's your business. 
Don't do that in the house of God, though. And you come here because of that. You come here to be clean. You come here to get that feeling of wash. Not that feeling of guilt. You come here and you worship and you feel better. You come here and you hear God's word and you feel convicted, not condemned. I'm telling you right now, I told you from the beginning, this is hitting the moon, guys. You want to be a black belt? Imagine going into the gym the first time, seeing a guy putting three plates on each side, 315, there's two, two, and you, I want to be like that. Hey, do me a favor, would you put three plates on each side? Dude, you, you ever work out before? No, but I see everybody else doing it. You maybe want to start with just the bar. <laughs> if he can do it, I can do it. Just put it on. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. You understand the correlation, guys? Come here if you don't live up to these things. It's okay. Don't try to do it in your own flesh. Let God do them. How do you do that? Oh, we've talked about this a thousand times. Prayer. Bible study. Worship. Church. Just keep coming. God will do the work. God will do the work. Unlike wrestling, you don't have to shoot 20,000 double legs before you do it right. Here, you just come here. God will, God will teach you how to do it. You just show up. That's what we do with Kelly with the kids at the gym. Little kid, little tiny, four, five, six, seven-year-olds, just put them in the class. You know, you get kids that have been there two or three years, like Joey, or my son who's been there a year and a half. He doesn't keep them to the same standard. No, no, no. They're here, Ryan. They're here. Just the fact that they're learning the discipline. Perfect. Same thing. With here, you come here, gentlemen, and if you've been here for more than a couple of years, and I'm going to look at you and go, what are you doing? Dude, what are you doing? But if you've only been here a few months, like, hey, man, I'm just glad you're here. I am just glad you're here. You guys that got baptized, yes! Good job. Obedience number one. I'm not going to hold you... Did you drink beer last night? You know, like, come on. It's not what you come here for. This is how we conduct ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And ready? The last thing, here's where we close. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, there's a big mystery. There's no controversy about it. Here is it. You ready, deacons and elders? <laughs> Understand this is the mystery of godliness. It's the beginning and the ending. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. When you could understand all that stuff, and you could teach all that stuff, and you can live all that stuff, maybe it's time to be a deacon and elder. I believe that. Can you? Can you understand? God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. And you're sitting there going, well, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Then you're not an elder or a deacon. I guarantee you my elders and deacons understand this. You better. <laughs> Close your Bible. Praise God you're here. Next week we're going to talk some more about the end times as the Word of God goes to that direction. If you are interested in being an elder or a deacon, please see one of our elders or deacons. And they'll tell you how to get on the road to this. Ladies, be nice. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> Are we cool still? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, for my brothers that are here now, that are and my sisters that are here, that are thinking, man, their husbands really are falling short. Or the brothers that are here that are thinking how short they fall as well. God, we commit these things to you. We can't do them without you. We can't even try. God, I pray, have your way in our hearts and our minds. Have your way in our lives, please, above all things. 
Desperately, we need more servants of the Most High God to help people who are hurting, to help people who need. Father, if there's one man here who heard these things and said, yes, this is what I want. This is my new goal. God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give them the strength to do it. And if there's an, a man here who heard these things and thought, eh, it's, not my, it's not my plan, but God, your plan for them is different. God, speak to their hearts as well. And may they grab that horse by the reins as well. God, help us as we leave here. May your spirit move upon our hearts. May we digest this meal in a way that brings glory to your name. Thank you so much, God. We love you. In Christ Jesus we ask it. Amen. Amen.